Okay, um, I'm in Colorado, family, um, family thing, <laughs> but I am, uh, let's see, where am I? I am up in this corner up here um, in ranch land and farmland, and it's cold. Uh, so, but I, I look, I, I wanted to, to, and this is going to be a little bit longer of a video. Uh, I'm going to save my rant or my, uh, I guess, my commentary to the very end. But I, I have attached um, to this post uh, three documents, um, and they've been redacted, but it's, it, it has to do with um, a board policy that changed, uh, pro prohibiting the, the recording of IEP meetings and 504 meetings, uh, unless, of course, you know, the powers that be, the kings and the queens, um, you know, the demigods, the power people, uh, the anointed ones, determined that, that you can record. Um, then we're going to look at the OSEP uh, policy, which is still sort of, sort of the, the governing guidance, uh, you know, and it's just a policy, it's just guidance, it's a guidance letter. Um, and then we're going to look at how it was actually impacted uh, with a family that did request um, to record, which is they've always recorded in the past, and then they got their rejection letter. And so we're going to walk through all three. Uh, and so you're going to see me pull up these. Well, you're not going to see that I pulled up the documents, but I'm going to pull up the documents uh, so that I can read them. And I'm also going to wear my glasses, okay, because I'm getting old. Um, okay, so the first, I, I'm looking at the policy itself, okay? And what the policy says is that the recording of an, of, of an individual, of an IEP or 504 meeting is prohibited, whoa, unless a parent or guardian authorized representative of a parent or guardian is unable to understand, and you got to follow the, 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 the language on this is unable to understand or meaningfully participate in the IEP or Section 504 process or the planning of the relevant student's educational program, and this is where it gets nuts, due to a disability, language barrier, or some other impairment, which they didn't define. Okay? So they have crafted an agreement and limited the number of people that potentially could, uh, um, and then making a decision that the only people that can't meaningful, mean, meaningfully participate or understand the process or the planning of the relevant students' educational pro process, what they're what they're arbitrary, what they are saying is that the only people in their viewpoint that can't do those things are people with disabilities, language barriers, or, or, or having some other impairment that they didn't define. That, and that's ridiculous. To sit there and, and crawl into the minds of, of parents in a very complex law where they have decision-making power, where at the same time, the law doesn't consider them an expert, okay? They're there to participate, and they have meaningful participation per the law. And in fact, they have enforcement uh, provisions. They can trigger uh, the dispute resolution process if they disagree with the public school in the form of mediation or due process or a state complaint or file an OCR complaint. So the parent has power, but by God, if, if they don't understand the process, and if they don't understand the, the planning that's going on, then what better way to help the parents further understand, especially if they're in a meeting where the school has um, limited the amount of time that they have for their meeting. Okay, that's number one. Number two, if the IEP has already been drafted in advance, and let's say these yahoos decided that, that you used to get a draft copy in advance so that you could prepare and understand. But now, see, 
a lot of these schools, in conjunction with not wanting you to record, they also don't want to provide you drafts in advance of the meeting. So the first time you're setting eyes on, on these IEPs that they've created, which they're allowed to do in order to try to condense how long it would take to have these IEP meetings uh, or these IEPs uh, uh, created, they don't provide a copy. So the first time you're setting eyes on them is at the meeting, which you're not allowed to record. But yet you're going to be given your hour of time as we rush through this to meaningfully participate. You see how nonsensical that is? It's just absolutely insane. But instead, don't worry. Don't worry. One of our people are going to be taking notes using their perception and their perspective on what was said, how I understood it as a parent what was requested and what was determined. I've read enough IEP, guys. I've, I've, I do this all the time. And I can't tell you how many stupid, petty due process cases I have where the parents sit in a meeting and they hear that, oh, well, yes, we're going to provide your child um, an aid. And the parent goes, oh, that's exactly what I wanted. Thank you very much, school district. You're so awesome. And then what ends up happening is, is that the parents left thinking one thing because that's how it was conveyed, or at least it wasn't clarified. And then when they get home and they actually read the copy of the IEP, either immediately or later, they find out that it's really just access to adult support. It's not an aid, not in the way that the parents thought and not in the way that it was sort of cleverly communicated to them because that's how IEP meetings go. A lot of these school people are trained to communicate this way. Okay, it's the absolute misuse of language. Now, if our police officers now are wearing body cams and they're doing it to protect the police and the citizen, then I do not understand why a school district feels that they are going to be less transparent. And not only that is less transparent with, with basically the only two kinds of parents that can injure a school system financially. Because 504 parents and, and IDEA parents have a carve out that allows them to challenge the decisions of the school system when it comes to their children's educational programs or accommodations to where at the end of the day, if the parents are justified in their claims, what do they get? Corrective action. That costs money, that costs resources. Not only that is, you have the right to get an attorney involved like myself. And if you're justified in your claim, then your attorney fees are reimbursed or paid by the school system. So why a school would, would want to create an inane, crazy policy that as it's going to be interpreted by the parents that this is impacting, it, it's automatic. What are you trying to hide? What are you scared of? And, and I've, I've heard that the reason that they did this was because some parents, you know, threw the recordings up on, on social media. Now, I think that's stupid. I think that's stupid. You know, parents out there, I, it's absolutely stupid to put your IEP meeting on social media. FERPA is a one-way road, all right? It only applies to the school system. You could sit there and hand out your child's IEP, slap it on a new or the front page of the New York Times if you want to. <laughs> but it, 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 it's absolutely inconsiderate. You're not being considerate of the other people in that room. Um, by slapping it up. There's just different ways to handle stuff like that. And that's not the way to handle it. But if this school system had some people that they, that they, that did stuff like that, then, you know, carve out policies that impact the people that, that, that have abused it. See, this is the same argument that's been made about why we need to get rid of the second amendment. Because you have a fraction of the population abusing guns and you sit there and you go on, but James, that will kill people. Yeah. So do police, but they also, and I'm talking about in an unjustified way. Sometimes that happens. 
we taken their weapons away? Things happen. Abuses occur. Parents throwing IEP meetings up on an internet. So you're going to take everyone else's rights away? That are not abusing it? That truly need these things to fully participate? And not because they have a disability or a language barrier or some other impairment that you didn't bother to define? See, it, 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 it's not broad enough. And as we're about to see, the OSEP letter, <laughs> that's not going to fly. So, if a parent believes that the recording of the IEP or 504 meeting is necessary, the parent should notify the principal or designee in writing at least five days before um, to request to record the meeting and the reason the recording is required. And then the principal will notify the parent at least two days before the meeting to grant, see I love that, it's just like king or queen language. I will grant you, okay, grant or deny the parent uh, the request for recording the meeting. All right, now this is the kicker. They want your reason, but yet they already told you who they're going to allow. And if you can't clearly state that you have a disability or a language barrier or, or some other impairment that they didn't define, you see where the problem lies. Uh, so it, it's, 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 it's a BS uh, policy just right there. So, I mean, you can provide your reason, but, you know, unless it's in that carve out in that first paragraph, then they've got you. Um, if the principal denies a request, the reasons will be stated in, in the writing, and we're going to go into that when we look at the denial letter. Um, authorize exceptions to the general prohibition against the recording involve situations when a parent or authorized representative is unable to understand or meaningfully participate. Um, and then they restate in paragraph three exactly what they had stated in paragraph one, which is, which is how they're carving that out. Their, their exceptions are limited to those three areas. Um, must use his or her own audio recording device uh, if the school district records an IEP meeting, resulting recording shall become a part of the student's records and be maintained in accordance with state and federal law. All right. For the purpose of this policy, a recording is defined, okay, blah, blah, blah. The use of a court reporter is prohibited. Video recording is prohibited. Um, all right. So that is their policy that they just adopted right before the Christmas break. So let's look at the OSEP letter. Um, that governs this currently, and this was from 2016. And like I said, OSEP is the Office of Special Education Programs that um, is part of the Department of Education in Washington. And they provide guidance letters for clarification for things within the IDEA or things not in the IDEA. So in this particular situation, recording an IEP meeting is not part of the IDEA. Okay, it's silent on the issue, doesn't say anything about it. So that's what they say. Um, we're at, okay, so you'll see in the second paragraph, raise concerns about the policy recording IEP meetings, uh, part B of IDEA, which is the part governing age three to 21 uh, inside public education is silent regarding the use of audio or recording devices at IEP meetings. OSEP has previously stated in the letter to anonymous, so you can also look that up by just writing letter to anonymous and use the date, June 4, 2003. And in appendix A to 1999 IDEA, this is what it says, that part B does not address the use of audio or video at the IEP meetings and no other federal statute either authorizes or prohibits the recording of an IEP meeting by either the parent or the school officials. Therefore, the state educational agency or public agency has the option to require, prohibit, limit, or otherwise regulate the use of the recording devices. If the public agency has a policy that prohibits or limits the use of the recording, that policy must provide for exceptions. If they are necessary to ensure that the parent understands the IEP or the IEP process or to implement other parental rights guaranteed under Part B. Now, do you see anywhere in that with regards to the exceptions? that it's limited to uh, disability, language barrier, or some other impairment. No, because at that point, 
see this policy is correct because it says that it, it you know the exceptions need to be there to ensure that the parent understands the IEP or the IEP process or to implement other parental rights guaranteed under Part B. Now, that's broad. That's okay. Because how do you sit there and crawl into somebody's mind and go, well, you know, they have a PhD. And, you know, like somebody like me, if they wanted to prohibit me from, I mean, first of all, I'd ignore them. Um, <laughs> try it uh, but if they wanted to I'm just saying that I have a knowledge of this area I do but at the same time if they wanted to put arbitrary factors on my IEP meeting for example they they set it at two o'clock knowing that three o'clock is at the end time knowing that I only have an hour for my IEP meeting and they refuse me a draft in advance to consider then forget it guys that is not enough time for this complicated process and which is is full of required areas under the federal law that they've got to cover to ensure that my child is receiving a free and appropriate public education so time limitations and not receiving a, a draft in advance is enough in my viewpoint to provide an exception for me to be able to record so i can understand it so i can go back and play it back because this is going to be a rush process in order to get this done within that time frame that you as a school system put on me you want to take all that stuff away and you want to develop an IEP from scratch without a draft in advance with no limitation and we start at 8 a.m. great perfect I won't record but that's not how this works does it so you guys set these arbitrary standards of these limitations and then you sit there on top of it and say well you can't record we're going to rush through this real quick and we already we already created the draft version in areas that you're not an expert and you don't understand but trust us we're the experts no you're not I, I've, I've done this long enough guys they do not train the the educators the case managers properly and I'm talking about an individual school levels. Not only that is, with the amount of turnover that we have currently all over the country with regards to a lack of educators, the lack of special education staff, the lack of paraprofessionals, the turnover in administration, which this particular school district just recently had a turnover in, in special education administration. So I'm to trust that all of you people are experts in, in how to design an appropriate IEP and implement one? No, you're not. And so this is a further exception that I need to safeguard my rights. And that's what it says, doesn't it? To safeguard other aspects of your parental rights under Part B. But in this OSEP letter, it doesn't, it doesn't limit you. It doesn't sit there and say, well, only if you have a disability language barrier or other impairment. That, by the way, they didn't define. I'm going to keep saying that, by the way. It remains OSEP's position that in the absence of IDEA requirements, the state in the best position to decide, the state is the best, in the best to, to, to decide the specific criteria that it will use to permit audio. Um, however, a requirement for parental participation at meeting at a meeting of their child's IEP team, which are found at 34 CFR, um, statute 300.322 require okay require public agencies to ensure that parents are notified of their child's IEP meeting early enough to ensure that they have an opportunity to attend I mean all of those things are in there okay giving you enough notice to participate so um, Secondly, you ask whether it is permissible for the school district to suspend recording of an IEP meeting uh, based upon its assessment of whether the parent has had adequate opportunity to fulfill, uh, to fully understand the meeting. As noted above, while the state has a discretion to determine the criteria for use, including a suspen suspension of audio uh, and recording devices at IEP meetings, the public agency must, must, 
take whatever action is necessary to ensure that the parent understands the proceedings of the IEP team meeting. Now, how do you do that? How do you ensure? And, th and that's where, you know, it, it, policies like this just aren't worth it, guys. I mean, because all you're doing is setting it up to where now a judge gets to hear it. And then a judge makes a determination uh, and, and still same thing, an arbitrary determination. But yet it's going to waste a lot of resources because attorneys cost money to, to argue about petty, stupid stuff. So that's the OSEP. The rest of it has to deal with something else. Um, so we go back to their policy after reading the OSEP. And I want to read that, that uh, a carve out again, the, that the recording is prohibited unless a parent, guardian, authorized representative is unable to understand or meaningfully participate in the IEP or 504 process or the planning of the relevant student's educational program. See, that section, that part right there that I just read is in that OSEP letter. That is in there, almost verbatim. What's not in there is the exceptions. In the OSEP letter, the exceptions are for, for fairly broad, which then covers everything. I mean, that broad exception covers disability, language barrier, and some other impairment that they didn't want to define. But it also covers all those other things that I talked about. The fact that the parent, even though they're their, their child's advocate, just simply doesn't have the breadth of knowledge that I do as a special education attorney or even as a trained advocate, but yet they're legally responsible to, to participate and they have those rights to fully participate. To sit there and, and sit there and go, well, you know, we're going to give you that opportunity to, to fully participate. How are you going to do that? Because you're going to allow me to occupy a seat and breathe some oxygen? But what else have you done? What else have you done to, to, you know, and how are you defining meaningfully participate? Let's start there. How about that? How are you as a school system defining what you need to do in order to secure me that opportunity to meaningfully participate? Hmm? Please put that down on paper so I can check off a list of what it means to you. That, that, you know, so that I know what meaningful, mean, meaningful participation is in the viewpoint of my school system. Because, I mean, these words mean something, people. These words have power. And, you know, I have so many parents that they read this stuff. And, and because it sounds all official, you know, about meaningfully participate, then they, they miss that last part where that exception is narrowly defined by the school system, whereas the federal guidelines are not narrowly defined. It doesn't limit you. The exceptions can, can take into consideration all of those things that I discussed, and this policy does not take into consideration those things. And in fact, it's, it's, it's severely limiting your rights and then having to ask freaking permission so that the government can grant you your, your right, your parental rights that are already yours. They're already yours. Asking permission. Okay. So here, here is the rejection letter. And the parents followed that stupid procedure and they asked and they put in there that, you know, we uh, believe that we require this in order, you know, because it's a complicated process. We believe that, uh, uh, and the reason I know this is that I help them. I helped them. Um, um, I gave them some advice <clears throat> on, you know, how to explain that why they need this to meaningfully participate. This is a complicated process, and like I said, you're going to limit the time. You're going to have a draft in advance. Um, you know, we're going to whiz through it. Then I'm sorry, I need to play this back so I understand. I also need to play it back because you're the, the one maintaining formal meeting minutes. 
using your perspective, your perception of what's understood. Um, and my meeting notes as a parent are not held um, on an equal or equivalent status as the school note taker. So if I'm taking notes and they're taking notes, then I can tell you that deference is going to be given to the school system in the eyes of the judge, which I don't think is fair. Because we are dealing with the perception of whoever's taking the notes. And I have no idea what kind of uh, wink, wink, this is how you need to hear it um, in the clever way that you, and I've been in too many of these. And I know you can sit there and say, well, that's conspiratorial, James. I have been in too many of these meetings to where they're reading back what James Galini said and whoever was taking the notes did not notate what James Galini intended or what my intent was or exactly what I said. So it was skewed. And if that happens to me when I'm in these meetings, then, you know, why in, in the world wouldn't we want a tiebreaker in the form of a, a recording? Now, the OSEP letter said that the school could record, um, or maybe it was the school policy letter. Let me look. That if the school district records, that it will become part of the student's educational record. Great. Great. Who cares? Record. But do you know what that also means? Is that when the parents ask for a copy of their child's uh, educational record, in the form of that recording, you need to hand it over to them. But I don't necessarily have a problem with that. Unless, of course, you want to play the game that, that you guys play when it comes to your videos. You know, it's amazing how your videos never work if it's something that, that uh, uh, indicates that you guys were wrong. It's always grainy. Oh, there was an obstruction. Who the hell put up your videos? <laughs> if that's the case, oh, there was an obstruction. I would... I would go and call the person who installed your video camera and say hey did you know that uh, there was a big pole sitting right in front of the camera lens like you know i'd be like me recording like this but i mean does it shock me really i mean you know we pay six thousand dollars for a shovel uh with the military so you know it, it's government um but this letter that's what i was reading before i got sidetracked Okay, the memo, and and the other thing, it looks like the you know your it looks like an invitation to a wedding or a prom, by the way, um, where everything's centered. It's so official, um, and I, I don't know, maybe I mean maybe we need to send a uh, reply an RSVP that we will be there <laughs> in a party of two. Please, um, we will be eating, and uh, it will be me and my wife. Thank you very much. Um, okay, this memo is in response to your request sent via email on this date to record the IEP meeting concerning your son, blah, blah, blah. During the IEP meeting, you will have every opportunity to meaningfully participate. Though she didn't define what that means. I mean, what is meaningful participation in the viewpoint of the school system? And be an equal and be an equal participate. Therefore, the request for recording is denied. The IEP and meeting minutes will be provided to you immediately following the meeting. You see that? The meeting minutes will be provided to you, taken by whoever we select, using their perspective, their perception, how they heard the information, um, and then handed to the parent and said here and somehow that's equal to a recording nonsense bs crap i mean that's it guys i mean we walked through all three documents and as you can see the osep document is broad in its definitions yes the school system can sit there and say well you know yeah you can limit it but at the same time, you have parental rights. And, and if you require it, and look, and there are some parents that don't require it. But the other thing is, is if you're a parent that is abused, this opportunity, like people that abuse weapons, 
yeah, I, I'm, there's no pity coming from me if you decide to throw your IEP meeting up uh, on, on a, a social media site. You get no support from James Galini. You have abused your right. So therefore, I have no problem if you get a rejection letter. Be smarter than that. That isn't how you deal with issues. Ever. It's not. Okay? Uh, because it's not taken into consideration the other people in the room, the other educators. You may have an issue with that administration, but a lot of these teachers, you know, general ed teacher, the special education teacher, speech language pathologist, everybody that's on your child's team, so many of them are victims of this process as well. Told to be in these meetings and before you ever showed up, before you ever show up, are being told by the administration or whoever's in charge that you better walk the line. You better, better be a loyal soldier. You better not pipe up. Now, how do I know that? Well, because I have many educators in the, in the state of Alabama that, that don't consider me an enemy. And they shouldn't because I fight for them as well. They are being asked to do a Her Herculean job with little to no resources or support. They're short staffed, they're underpaid, they don't have enough aid support, and they don't have the support of their administration, uh, meaning mainly the Board of Education and, and the superintendent, um, the special education director in many instances is also hamstrung by a budget and budget restrictions. Nobody wants to spend money on special education. Nobody that, that, that doesn't have a child with it or doesn't have a passion for working with children with disabilities. Everybody else would rather spend it on a new football stadium or to sit there and increase their coach's salary by uh, uh, making him a glorified aid so that they could take money out of the Title I funds or out of special education funds to sit there and supplement uh, his income. They like to do that. But the reality is that, you know, I don't expect people who don't have a child with a disability to ever understand, to ever understand. But at the same time, what I do want all of you people that have healthy children and, and those without uh, additional needs is that don't tell me how much I know and don't tell me what I understand and what I don't understand. These are our kids. Do you know how nerve wracking that is to sit there and know that you have a, a decision making piece in your child's therapy and educational program? And you don't want to make a mistake because you already carry so much with you anyway, just being a parent. You know, and that breaks me up because, guys, I'm an IEP team member myself. My daughter didn't come with an instruction manual. She came with autism and, a, and, a, and no ability to communicate in, in the beginning. With behaviors. So no, nobody, nobody told my wife and I, well, this is how you fix it. That's what got me into this field. Is that the people that we trusted or we expected to have the answers didn't have the answers. And in fact, we're fairly callous, you know, when, when our daughter, daughter turned three. And made some flippant, smart-ass comments to my wife and I about, you know, how long it's going to take. To, to get uh, an ADOS done and, you know, good luck. He's sitting on a waiting list. Well, that isn't the way to communicate to my wife and I. And quite frankly, if you are, are, are in this field, it's just not the, the best way to communicate with anybody. Because we don't know. We're looking for answers. Because quite frankly, the medical field, by and large, has been a, an, an utter disappointment to many of us that have children with, with special needs. 
insurance has been an, an utter nightmare and a grand disappointment that we've had to sit there and fight, and it still isn't enough. You know, Blue Cross Blue Shield in Alabama still doesn't care. Obstinate bastards. But yet we were successful with Medicaid, weren't we? Or Medicare. Well, we were successful with some insurance. We were successful with state employee teachers that have children with special needs. We got you guys covered. You know, so it's not some thing to where we're trying to be obstinate and we're trying to be different. It's not about that. But you're not looking at the situation through proper lenses. We want to be the best parents we can be for our kids. It's harder for us to trust especially if our children have limited communicative abilities and can't come home and tell us what they did during the day. That puts more on us, on you guys, to be transparent and partner with us. And the more information that we receive, the more calm we become and more collaborative we are. It's when you turn the opposite direction and you become more restrictive, when you want to curb or limit severely our access to, to um, the school and classrooms under BS arguments like FERPA. Guys, these are the things that end up turning into a fight. And it is our civil rights movement. It really is. This right here, no different than what you government idiots, you know, the, the same thing. I mean, how arbitrary is it to sit there and say, well, you know, um, African-Americans can't sit down on a bus. You know, but if there's a white person, you, you know, male or female white person, and you get your butt up and you let that person have your seat. And many of you out there go, well, oh, James, that was an insane law. This is an insane policy. And you want parents to just accept it? And acknowledge your, your power and your abuse? No. No. So sometimes you need to Rosa Parks it up. Rosa Parks says, join up and don't move. You move. Now, you know, guys, those of you that live in these school districts, you're going to have to make that individual decision of what you're going to do about it. Okay? All right? Because I'm not telling you, you know, to get yourself in trouble. I'm just telling you my perspective and how I interpret this nonsense. At the same time, understand that 100% of what I do is fixing the mistakes of government misapplication of rules and law and regulatory guidance. That's all I do. So the rules are there. It says that you need to do X, Y, and Z. But they do A, B, and C in violation of X, Y, and Z. You see, the, the, the rules were there. They didn't follow it. So that's why I had to get involved. So to sit there and say, well, you know, but they shouldn't be doing that. What? Well, no crap. But so there's nothing keeping them from being abusive of you. Just be prepared for that. But they're not going to kill you. They're not going to hurt you. They're not going to imprison you. You know, it's going to be a grand irritation. And you've got to determine whether or not you're going to lay down for this crap. And what you're going to do about it. 
and that's a, that's a citizen decision, okay? But in the meantime, you know, what are you doing to go to your Board of Education? What are you doing to sit there and, and create some noise with other people in your community? Or are you just going to stay silent or are you going to complain? I mean, that's what Americans love to do. We all like to complain. And then there's further encroachments on our rights, on telling us what to do. People that have no business telling us what to do. Most of these people can't balance their own freaking checkbooks. Most of these people's lives are, are in shambles themselves. And sure as hell shouldn't be telling other people how they live their life and what they can or cannot do. But that's the nature of government. You know, you give people a badge, a gun, a little bit of power, and they somehow think that they have some kind of magical control over you. And they don't. They have as much control as you give them. This is a republic, for God's sakes. We have people clamoring from all over the world wanting to get to this place. And there's a reason why. I just don't like people telling me what to do. Unless it, unless it makes sense to me. You know, but I don't need laws to sit there and tell me how to be a civil, peaceful, loving, moral, and ethical individual. I don't need other people to tell me that. So a lot of the laws that exist out there are nonsensical because I don't need them to control my own passions and my own self. And that's the majority of us out here. We don't need those kind of restrictions. We don't need somebody telling us what to do. We wake up every day and we know what right from wrong. But when it gets into this inane nonsense, there's no, there's, there's no public benefit to this. It's not serving some grand plan to sit there and create a peaceful environment. This is selfish and self-motivated and, and, and is a government out of control telling you what you can or cannot do in an area of law where you have rights. And to have people come in and, and, and try to tell you what meaningful participation is for you is nonsense. I'd like to follow all of them around and say, well, uh, get that spoon out of your mouth. You've had enough. Some of them we need to do that too. But I'm just saying. It's the same thing. Following somebody around and go, uh, you bowled enough. That was meaningful participation on your bowling night. Rack it up, go home. Oh, you've had enough martinis. You know, we just don't do that, guys. We expect people to govern themselves. You teach people correct principles, and you govern yourself, and you expect people to do it. If you have people that have abused this policy, then go after those people. Or don't, I don't think there should be a policy, but if they've abused those opportunities, then you go after them. Don't sit there and have it ripple into people that, that, that are innocent, have nothing to do with that, that nonsense. I'm sure I'm gonna get some calls and some letters. Um, and, um, and I know that this is going to be copied and pasted and shared, you know, all over the state and the education system. And you guys have my number. All right. Because <laughs> it just, what are you going to do? I, I, you know, I disagree with this. Absolutely. And so should you. So should you if you love this country. If you love this state. What would you do if it was you? But you guys treat each other differently if you work in government, don't you? You guys get a pass. <laughs>